Hello, Mr. Alex. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. You had a rough day, didn't you? I can tell. I can just see it in the look in your eyes. Uh, mm. No, no, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyhow, so tonight we have um, two really amazing high-level people on um, that wrote a really amazing book. It's not out yet, but it will be, I hope, soon. And we've got Dr. Kendall Lee and Dr. Bazell um, on tonight. They're together. They're going to talk about this cool new book and about dopamine and beauty and what it means. How, you know, why is one person beautiful and one other person isn't? Because we all kind of perceive beauty the same way. Don't well, we? Don't I mean, we? I, mean I, I know they're beautiful. <laughs> Well, if they're one of your children. Yeah, well, your kids always are beautiful, do you? <laughs> so anyhow, but they'll be at the bottom of the hour, or maybe a little earlier. Maybe we'll push them up a little earlier. Um, uh, anyhow, have you gotten all your Christmas shopping done? Uh, a good chunk. Of course, good there's chunk. a handful of people you can never find. I know. Before. It never ends. You always keep thinking of new people. It's like, oh, I forgot about so and so. Oh, they're gonna, you know what I mean? It's just, it's no end to it. Yeah, and then you know what? It doesn't matter how well you have your bases covered. Someone shows up last minute, and you're like, oh no. Yeah. So this will be um, <clears throat> interesting for you this year because you've got a new house, mm -hmm. kind yeah. of a new family sort of going on. Yeah. Kind of. Just cool. It's kind of sort of. Anyhow, well, I've, you know, as you know, I've got a shop for six kids and tons of relatives. And Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys are expensive, super expensive. So um, I was going to brag a little bit about speaking of six kids. One of them illustrated a book. She's very young. She's all of what, 18, Alex? Yeah. Don't yeah. put it. Here you are, so quick. Don't put it up yet. But anyhow, so she's 18, and already this is her second book that she's illustrated, which is really amazing. This is Asia we're talking about. And so she got together with Yvette, and they put together a kid's book that is called Frankie and Lola Beyond the Fence. And I'm just really, you know, I'm just proud, and I just wanted to show it off. I don't brag too much. But do you have it, and you can put it up? Yeah, there's the book. It's already on Amazon. It's kind of the um, illustration style that she did. But just, it's really amazing. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, for, you know, for a kid that has no art training, and for her to just master all the art that she does, it's just really cool. So where do you think talent comes from? From you, obviously. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> although although my dad was an artist. Well, there you go. Yeah, he was. And we're bohemian. Yeah, and you've been, uh, I mean, look at your designs and all the logos oh, you've yeah. done. And... Yeah, no, I've done it. But I wouldn't consider myself an artist and maybe a little more of a graphics person. Graphic designer. Yeah, I can't freehand. Where, where your sister can freehand stuff. It's just amazing. So anyhow, but that book is out. It's a great, be a great Christmas gift for anybody up to what five years old. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, it's available yeah, on perfect. Amazon. It's called Frankie and Lola Beyond the Fence, and it's kind of a, I guess it's, there's a uh, moral to the story. It's about big brothers helping little sisters and taking care of them down there, and they're going on adventures. You know, beyond the fence. Yeah, it's super cool. cute, fun. It's book. just cute. Yeah, heartwarming. Yeah, heartwarming. So if anybody's looking for Christmas gifts, we there would appreciate go. it. Knock that off the list. <laughs> yeah, knock it off. Yep. Anyhow, moving on. Um, speaking of, of, of really cool, weird things, I saw this thing where MIT um, technicians and DNA people, and I don't know what they're using, CRISPR, God knows, but they're, they're, taking and they're making plants glow they're they're taking things like you know um bioluminescence in fireflies and and um, jellyfish and all these things 
and they're trying to incorporate them. Eventually, their goal is to make trees that glow. Trees. Isn't that isn't that like Avatar? Yeah, basically. I mean, <sighs> they're thinking that this would be a real, you know, basically free streetlights. So, like organically, they would just glow. Yeah. So you would you would line the streets with these glowing trees. So then you wouldn't even need street lights. Right. That's a cool idea. It'd be beautiful. I don't know if they'll do it, but they've done it with spinach and kale. Really? Yeah. So they've got glowing spinach. I'll get you some. Should we uh should we sh show them the video? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just I think it's just a um, rendition. Mm. Of what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, you should have had the video up while I was talking to you. <laughs> but there we go. So that, I mean, that would be cool. It really would be. And he's just talking about MIT. So, what else is in the news? Oh, my God. There's so much stuff. Just a bunch of little stuff. Um, There was a bird. I think it's a bird. Pretty sure. I don't know what type. But I thought, well, if anybody can identify, we'll, we'll put it up. It's, um, I don't know how I labeled it when I sent it to you. Do you know which one I'm talking about? It's this weird animal. You can't really even tell what it is. And I, do you know which one? It's a bird. <laughs> it's a bird. Do you, do you know what video I'm talking about? Um, I'm not, I don't want to. It's an unknown it's animal, it says. It's, it's an unknown animal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Okay, it's re it is really weird. I'm looking at it. I purposely didn't re didn't research it, but I thought if somebody wants, to, oh no, you know what? I'm looking at it smaller now, and it looks like a goose, but I don't know what kind of goose. If anybody can identify it in the chat, we will send them a free untold radio at. How's that sound? But you got to identify the exact species. And put it in chat. Be the first one to stick it in chat. Okay. That is weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's a lot of extra skin. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next thing that I, I really read with a lot of interest and about the, I'd never heard of it, the gimpy gimpy plant. Have you heard of this? It is the most painful plant on the planet. If you get it on you, you touch it. Apparently, it's so bad and so painful and so toxic. This guy claims that people were literally killing themselves, committing suicide, because the pain would last for sometimes years, months, weeks. So it's like a poison ivy, but way worse. Yeah, apparently it's poison ivy times, you know, 10,000. So and apparently it's just loaded with toxins. It says it feels like if you get it on you and touch it, it feels like you're getting scolded with hot acid while being electrocuted. But what the problem is, it doesn't go away. It can last for weeks, months, longer. One guy got slapped in the face. He said it was severe for over two years, the pain. So it's just, it's with you basically forever. Well, Two years is, it would seem like forever, wouldn't it? No. I mean, with that kind of pain, it might as well be. Yeah, don't wipe your butt with it. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and then I, I sent you something too I found today. This really weird illusion of these they're, they're spinning dots, but none of them are spinning. Do you know which one I'm referring to? There we go. So just watch this animation. So each, this looks like these dots are all spinning around, but no, watch this. Every dot is moving in a perfectly straight line. It's all about timing. That is trippy. That's basically how e-bike um, motors work too. It's a sun gear. And each tooth of the gear is really running in a straight line. So it's trippy. I just got a bunch of weird yeah. junk yeah, it's tonight. It's a cool video. Yeah, it's, I'm just kind of weird. Um, 
I read a shocking fact today, and I thought it was really interesting. And then I kind of related it to my own my own life. It says that ninety eight percent of five year old kids. You got NASA did a study in the sixties. Ninety eight percent of five year old kids are creative geniuses. The problem is, is they claim that. Once we're institutionalized, we go to school, and we, well, we're basically taught to memorize things. And it kills the creativity in us. And we're, we're rewarded for just spouting off things we can remember, not necessarily comprehend. If that makes any sense. So the whole thing, the you created creativity, it's not for everybody. Now, I'm not saying this is for everybody, but it's certainly a large portion of people get less and less creative. And certainly what I've run into, which is one reason I ran out of school as quick as I could and um, quit school as quick as I could, and it, it, it worked out, unlike the gentleman we're going to have on tonight, which is a different deal because, you know, you need years of schooling to learn so many things. Oh, yeah. The amount it's a totally stuff. different thing. I'm not talking about that. Um, but I'm just talking about generally, there really aren't that many creative people. I don't run into a lot of them. And apparently the study was buried. It was kind of shocked the people that conducted the study. So it's kind of like trained out of you. Yeah, they say by age 25 that most people have lost almost all of their creativity. That's just sad. Yeah, it is. I thought, um, hmm, because it was my instinct, because I really, I actually felt it when I was in school. But by the time I was, God, 18, I was, I had already invented a polymer. But I felt like if I just would have stayed in school because they were teaching me, you know, I'm talking about high school now. There was nothing they were teaching me I was really interested in, you know, except maybe chemistry but they just kind of skirt over it. You know, once again, it's about memorizing. Memorize these symbols and memorize this. It was never about what we can do with these things, you know? So I think schools in many cases, certainly primary school up through maybe 12th grade, is they, I, I would love it if they would spend more time taking kids that are talented with a certain type of creativity and nurturing it. You know, let them experiment with things. So anyhow, then I sent you a really cool, I'd never seen an adult, not walking like this, an adult white buffalo. And buffalo are really amazing animals to begin with. And then you see a white one, you know, and it's such a beautiful footage walking on this, yeah, you know, it looks like snow, fresh snow. But White buffalo and white bison, um, or the American bison, um, are considered sacred. It looks huge. There's, yeah, yeah. No, it's a beautiful animal. But they're very sacred. They have significance in a lot of Native American religions. And one of the things I do remember is that it, when, when a white buffalo is born, it means there'll be some earth changes. Hmm. Can you tell uh, I'm still recovering from COVID and my cold? <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh man, it's been it's been a brutal, brutal. couple of weeks. Anyhow, so um, the other thing that really you know I like I like studying weird animals. Have you ever heard of the Surinam toad? Surinam toad. No, but it's it sounds really bizarre. Yeah, and I, I think you know a little bit about what it is, but go ahead and pop that up. So here's this toad. It has a very weird way of reproducing. Um, so it lays about 60 eggs, and the male takes the eggs and puts them on the female's back. Is it plain? Yeah, let me try to refresh it. it oh, okay, jam on the animation. There we go. There we go. So the, the males stuff these eggs on their back, and the, the female's skin grows around the eggs. Oh, that's actually so starts growing around the eggs, and of course the eggs develop. They actually mature till they're little frogs, but they're still under her skin. Looks and like something from a sci-fi movie. Oh yeah, it's completely alien. 
can you imagine we we well we kind of breed that way i guess in some ways we're not animals in you you know but think about them all over your skin <laughs> so then eventually they get big enough and they you know they wiggle and they just pop break off. out of her skin yeah, and they swim up to the surface get air and they live on their own but it's so alien like yeah but there's so many animals that have developed all these weird you know breeding techniques and looks and just things they can do and get away with just totally weird i actually got itchy thinking about it can you imagine yeah, just, no thank you, <laughs> you know I, oh and you've never had a you've never had the pleasure of a bot fly i had a bot fly once from belize and that's a grub that gets it's, it's a little egg that gets laid into you and then the, this grub starts growing under your skin and eventually it starts wiggling <laughs> No, thank you. <laughs> and then you have to you have to kind of cut it out, or eventually it'll you know it'll do the alien on you and chew its way out. <sighs> yeah, I had a bot fly in my back. Some people get them in their foreheads, and yeah, that's nasty. Super nasty. So then there was one really cool. I don't see, I hardly ever see any UFO footage. I think is interesting. But there was one that I sent you that's interesting only because it's so non-UFO-y. It's just like fireworks, but they go on forever. They don't quit. They'll go hours and just keep – do you have that footage? So you've got to watch this, and this is real typical. I think the first one that was recorded was in England about 12 years ago, and these have been going on all over the U.S. This is something now pilots are reporting. Like, literally, they're getting weekly reports of these pilots are, you know, airline pilots. Yeah. Okay, so this thing starts out as dots, comes down, splits apart. It looks kind of random, right? Doesn't mm. look organized. It looks just like fireworks. If you saw that, you'd think somebody shot a bottle rocket off. But watch. And people can say, well, they're drones. But... They're not drones because you would have to have gunpowder on board the drone mm. that would last hours and hours. And the weight of it, all this gunpowder, which burns pretty quick, you know, to create these sparks, it just wouldn't work out. I mean, you could, you could get, you could make something look just like this for maybe five minutes, maybe five minutes, yeah. But these things, um, pilots will watch these things perform these acrobats, acrobatic moves for literally hours. And you wonder, what are they doing? Because they act like they're more, um, I don't know, just having fun. So, yeah. All right. That's all we've got. I sped it up. So should we um, introduce our yeah absolutely yes so let me I've got to get it open so I don't want to well they have such an impressive background I yeah think. it is they're high level okay um, <clears throat> so I've got two people Dr. Kendall Lee. So he is one of the world's best neurosurgeons that we've got on Untold Radio tonight, which is really an honor. Um, but let me just kind of read what I have here. Um, Kendall H. Lee, MD, PhD, is a neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon specializing in stereotactic function neurosurgery. He is also a director of a neural engineering laboratory his clinical focus includes Parkinson's studying, you know, and, and fixing Parkinson's disease, um, tremors, dystonia, psychiatric disorders, like ob obsessive compulsive disorders, chronic pain. Obviously, he does things like, you know, brain tumor surgery and on and on and on. So it's just, it's amazing. And these guys can tell you more about what they do. And then we have... Um, um, Dr. Bazell, A, and of course I'm going to butcher his last name, Sharif, Sharif. It's a good, good shot. Well, how do you pronounce it, Alex? Don't ask me. <laughs> oh, don't ask you. Okay, well, we'll have to get it. Anyhow, he is a high-level 
plastic surgeon, once again, one of the world's best. His areas of specialized um, specialization include expertise in facial mm-hmm. reconstruction, facial aesthetic surgery, such as obviously, you know, um, lifts, neck brow lifts, fat grafting, replacing, volume loss, eyelid lift, um, expertise in breast surgery, breast reduction, breast lift, you know, all that stuff, expertise in body contouring procedures, um, complex facial eyelid, orbital reconstruction, trauma, or tumor. Um, And you can only imagine all the people that these two guys have helped. Well, they've teamed up, and they're writing a book about all things beauty and dopamine. Okay, and the name of the book is Beauty, Desire, and Dopamine. Very, very simple. And you wouldn't think that these guys would do this, or what would they have in common? What would a neurosurgeon and a plastic surgeon have in common? You just wouldn't think there'd be any. But they're going to find out there's a lot. Which is cool. And by them combining their skills and talents, um, they're, uh, you know, rethinking things. So without further ado, let's bring them both on. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hey. So um, I don't know where we want to start, but if I miss something and you want to get it in, let's get it in now. What did I, what did I miss about you two? Well, Doug, Alex, thank you so much for having us on your show. You know, we're very excited to be talking about this book that uh, we're writing together. So I, I'm I'm Dr. Kendall Lee. Um, Dr. Basil Sheriff. Yeah. And thank you. You've done a great job. Um, you know, it's really fascinating how, you know, sort of uh, some of the, um, you know, locker conversations Dr. Lee and I have had. Um, we talk about interesting things, books he's been reading, um, philosophy sometimes uh, really has a blossom to uh, our friendship and then uh, into this sort of uh, book writing that uh, really uh, really captures a lot of the thoughts and ideas we've had uh, over the past couple of years together um, and uh, working out uh, you know, in the gym and also you know, sometimes even working in surgery together. So uh, it's been wonderful uh, writing the book, and uh, we've learned a lot from it uh, throughout the process and have a lot of fun. Yeah, and, so, and what we discovered is that um, uh, Dr. Sheriff, as a plastic surgeon and myself as a neurosurgeon, we're kind of interested in similar things, but from a little bit different perspective. And so that's why you know the title of the book is uh, Beauty, Desire, and Dopamine. And uh, you know, as plastic surgeon, one of the key components of it is the artistry, the cosmetics, and the beauty. Well, as a neurosurgeon, I kind of look at all of those things from the inside and how it affects brain circuits and what neurochemicals are important in that process. So so you guys became friends first, right? Yes, that's right. And you guys just started having, I would imagine, very intellectual conversations and first, before, before we go any further, let's talk about just dopamine. Who discovered it? How did it get discovered? And what happened? Yeah, you know, this is a chemical that's been a um, very exciting discovery. The, the chemical actually was um, at first more discovered as it relates to movement disorders. And so, you know, uh, in your introduction, you said that I, I operate on Parkinson's patients. Well, in Parkinson's disease, one of the key problems there is this neurotransmitter dopamine is you know, gradually the cells that produce it are are dying. And so as we age, we lose more and more of dopamine. And so that neurotransmitter, uh, when you lose it, you can't move as well. That's why, you know, the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's is get tremor, rigidity, and slowness of movement. But this circuit uh, is the movement circuit, but there's another circuit in the brain where the dopamine is more for your emotional things. And, you know, amazingly, neuroscientists have figured out now the circuit behind this. uh, It's called the mesolimbic circuit, 
as a medical term, but uh, what's important is that this chemical has now been identified as a crucial chemical for our desire, for, you know, it's in an area of the brain that's a little bit different from the dopamine for movement, an area in the brain called the nucleus accumbens. It's a kind of like your pleasure center. It's near the center of your brain. And what's amazing about this chemical is that it ties together um, your wanting. So, for example, when you when you desire food, or you know, it's sex, food, and drugs. Um, amazingly, these are things that raises your dopamine level in the brain. So, um, you say we make less dopamine as we get older, but you know, I'm getting pretty old now, and I still feel actually as excited as I ever did. Does that mean that my body's doing a pretty good job making dopamine naturally? Do some people make, you know, in other words, is there a good percentage of the population where the dopamine levels don't drop or do they, does everybody's drop? Well, every, everybody's dopamine drops. So let, let me be clear. There's actually two uh, areas of dopamine production. Okay. One is the movement part, and that part of the brain is called substantia nigra compacta. And so that's the area of the brain in Parkinson's patients that the dopamine decreases, and that's the area that causes the movement problems. So, you know, the other area is called a VTA or ventral tegmental area. That's more for your emotional circuit, you know, and that's where the dopamine, uh, the, those cells or neurons, send its projections or the axons or, you know, where it releases the chemical dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. Now, there are, of course, other areas of the brain, you know, the circuitry is very complex, but we have now isolated that area, the nucleus accumbens, where um, that dopamine seems to be very important for our sensation of desire. Now, maybe I can also say that initially when dopamine was discovered, we thought that um, dopamine was a pleasure, you know? So some people uh, in the past have called it the pleasure neurotransmitter or the pleasure chemical. What we're now discovering is uh, it may not be pleasure neurotransmitter, in, in other words, just signaling pleasure, but more the wanting, you know? Okay. So is it, would you say it's more, it, it's a motivating factor? Like the, dr yeah. the inner drive you have to do something? Yeah. Uh, what's, what's so interesting is we are now uh, at a point in our scientific discoveries where we can actually, you know, uh, measure this dopamine, you know, by imaging um, sensors, special sensors and so forth. And when you measure this, amazingly, you can measure it going up, you know, when, when you um, have something that's pleasurable, you know. Uh, like food, drugs, and sexual behavior. So, so okay. So, if I'm eating a, a, a big bowl of ice cream, am I getting dopamine, or am I using dopamine up while I'm eating the ice cream? No, I mean, you know, the actual science of it is much more complicated than that. Okay. But yeah, but uh, uh, what we are able to see is these release of dopamine. Okay. from the area, you know, the, where the cells are coming from is the VTA. Now, one of the things that I think is very interesting and which is more in the realm of where uh, Dr. Sheriff operates is then how is that related to our perception of beauty, you know? So uh, when, when you look at something pleasurable or desirable uh, or even beautiful, this neurotransmitter system seems to be activated. Mm. And so, and, and that's why as Dr. Sheriff and I, we became friends and, you know, we had so many conversations before we even started to write this book. We realized that there are so many uh, interesting aspects that brings together a plastic surgeon, a neurosurgeon, neuroscientist, that we, we really felt the drive that we have to write this book. So for example, you know, I didn't really fully appreciate all of the mathematics that goes into uh, plastic surgery. You know, when a plastic surgeon does uh, facelifts or, you know, uh, nose jobs or eye jobs, you know, I didn't realize that there's so much mathematics and, and uh, science behind that. So when 
Dr. Shadow told me about that, I was just absolutely fascinated by that. Is there are there any um, things like the Fibonacci sequence and beauty? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Actually, uh, you know, there is the uh, the divine proportion that we all talk about, and that's something that's you know you can read about and 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 see in movies and textbooks, and 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 that's a uh, something that a lot of times we try to really confirm. You know, whether we 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 can see it in beautiful objects. Uh, so one of the ways, you know, uh, you can see that uh, if you do make a cross section in the snail shell, the way the snail shell is actually enlarges, uh, that's the, uh, the golden ratio, how the circles enlarge. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's the golden ratio. Um, the golden ratio is found everywhere, actually, in nature, um, in beauty, um, you know, a lot of people toyed with that. Um, you know, Da Vinci did, and uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, you know philosophers try to uh, to explain beauty based on that. Um, and definitely, in you know, when we looked at some uh, facial proportions, so going back to the mathematics of beauty, uh, we often think about proportions. So looking at a beautiful portrait, for example, of the face, what makes that different from a a uh, caricature, for example, of the same individual is really just playing with the proportions. If you were to take the proportions of the individual's face into sort of an extreme, you produce a caricature, which does not elicit the same sense of beauty that we would see in a beautiful portrait. So uh, so the golden ratio, we, we're finding that um, actually beautiful people, so if you look at the, you know, the, the, the beautiful uh, people that are typically, you know, uh, released uh, yearly by uh, several magazines, uh, you know, beautiful uh, uh, celebrities and whatnot, and men and women. Um, we've, 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 we look at their faces and actually there is a, a golden ratio when you look at their uh, facial height. So, you know, the hairline to their chin height and then their facial width, the, the, feet, the width of their lower jaw. Uh, that turned out to be very close to the golden ratio. So perhaps there's there's uh, some sort of mathematical explanation why we find certain faces more attractive, uh, beautiful uh, than than others, and and for sure the golden ratio is something where as plastic surgeons we're really int intrigued by, and try to use it to explain a lot of um, uh, you know concepts about beauty. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's really interesting. We were actually talking about the golden ratio a few shows back, and the Fibonacci sequence and how it, it really is beautiful. Um, okay, so dopamine. So when someone sees a beautiful person, do they get dopamine? And and what about when they look at themselves in a mirror? How is that all different? That's what I'm, you know, confused about and curious. Yeah, you know, we're still we're still really trying to figure all of this out. But I think your question is now getting to what is the mechanism of the perception within the brain itself, which is where neurosurgery, uh, you know, sort of comes in. I, I can tell you a really interesting case that uh, I was involved in, more uh, observing when I was a resident long, long time ago, where there was a patient that was, he, he was actually quite handsome uh, from California who had a disorder called uh, body dysmorphic syndrome. So what this disorder is, is even though you externally to everybody else, perhaps there's no uh, dysmorphia, meaning that, you know, disfigurement or so forth. Right. The brain itself can actually misinterpret. You know, you ask the question, what happens when you look at yourself in the mirror, for example? So this is a situation where this particular patient who externally actually was quite handsome, was a man, but every time he looked at himself in the mirror, all he saw was disfigurement. So this is an interesting uh, story that we put in our book where the treatment wasn't plastic surgery. It, you know, it's not cosmetic surgery because actually physically it was fine, but it was the perception. And so uh, I know this may sound amazing, but there is actually a neurosurgical procedure that's been done where you can 
uh, lesion different areas of the brain for body dysmorphic syndrome. Now, uh, this was a long time ago, and neurosurgery, you know, uh, like 20, 30 years ago, was doing surgeries where neurosurgeons would go in and lesion different area of the brain. In, in this case, it's an area called a cingulate gyrus that a neurosurgeon can go in with a probe and kind of lesion that area. And this actually uh, helped that patient. Wow. Yeah. Today, you know, the technology has uh, actually improved even more where rather than lesioning, we're now using technologies, you know, where we can uh, put in different uh, electrodes and, you know, stimulate different circuits. Uh, in the case of Parkinson's, you know, you mentioned I do Parkinson's patients. Uh, this type of technology has now helped thousands of patients with Parkinson's disease, you know, tremor, dystonia. And this is technology now that we're moving into uh, psychiatric disorders as well. And so I, I, I think what that story kind of illustrates is as I think about, you know, patients who have problem with uh, these kind of, you know, you, you could say there are kind of circuit problems that neurosurgeons, you know, in the past and now have tried to help these patients by doing brain operations rather than cosmetic operations. Gotcha. <clears throat> and I would imagine that's why a lot of people who are beautiful already, they chase plastic surgery and they actually make themselves worse, you know, if, you know, because they go to a bad surgeon or whatever, but it never, it seems to end for some people, you know, they just keep yeah. chasing it. And you're saying they could be cured with um, some type of a smaller procedure in the brain. Well, but uh, let me be clear that that type of surgery, you know, this would be for very, very severe okay. body dysmorphic syndromes, you know, gotcha. this is not for, you know, um, somebody, you know, I mean, so we have to be very careful. It's, it's very, not for somebody careful. having a bad hair day. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen my bad hair days. <laughs> but it's really fascinating because, you know, um, as we understand more about the the, uh, the circuitry inside the brain that elicits this uh, disorder, uh, where, you know, clearly there's sometimes really nothing, nothing wrong with the appearance of the person, but clearly the way they see themselves. So the perception of themselves is altered and skewed, and they see all kinds of imperfections. And... And it's really up on us as professionals to make sure we give them the right advice. And like you said, Doc, plastic surgery is not the answer in those cases. Um, we need to talk more about this. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of it is on social media and it's, it's, it's sort of amping up a lot of this uh, phenomena. But I think we, we, we have to be ethical and professional and really give, give folks the right advice when they need it. Yeah. And then now, now there's all of these filters that enhance people's looks, even in video, you know, gives their, makes their eyes bigger and sparklier and, you know, whatever. And it's just, I wonder what effect this is going to have, you know, on the whole human race. I mean, I'm sure that's something you guys have both thought about and talked about. Yeah, I know. This is fascinating. I mean, you're, you're seeing uh, these apps pop up every day, different apps yeah. and they enhance certain features. And, and I'm amazed how many, um, uh, how many people I see on my contact list and, and Facebook and are using now these morphed images, uh, which which really makes you wonder, you know, I mean, we all have a nice picture of ourselves that we like, uh, and we tend to use that picture uh, for, um, I don't know, a presentation or for a profile picture, but to alter the picture and enhance it further and basically show uh, an enhanced version of that picture, um, it's, it's something that's definitely, um, is on the rise and and now we are seeing these more routinely and our brain is going to be getting used to that um and we do get into this a little bit in our book um uh, as to you know how, what is what is the effect of that on 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 beauty our perception of beauty if this becomes a common common practice um you know because really none of these pictures are real so you're chasing uh you're chasing a ghost in a sense because yeah. you know the app can make your skin look flawless. Uh, it will erase all the wrinkles and 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 we, we we talk about sort of the beauty of imperfection, 
And that is that is something we have to really, uh, I think, delve more into. Uh, there is a beauty in imperfection. And, um, you know, Dr. Lee refers to uh, a very nice story, um, you know, the, the wabi-sabi uh, concept, uh, Japanese concept, uh, um, you know, uh, about the imperfection, the beauty yeah. of imperfection. You know, uh, well, this is not what, the wabi-sabi that you put on like sushi. That's okay. Like, that's not what that's talking about. <laughs> well, you know, may, may, maybe I can share a story about that that I, would... uh, I, I heard a long time ago that really touched me. And the story goes something like this. You know, there was a, there was a nobleman that invited a, like a Japanese emperor. And the emperor came, and at the end of the dinner, as the emperor was leaving, the nobleman gave him a beautiful vase, like a perfect vase. And the king looked at that, and rather than loving it, he just threw it down, smashing it into a thousand little pieces. And of course, this really crushed the nobleman's spirit, and the uh, emperor left. But what, what the nobleman did was to take each of those pieces, those thousand pieces, and glued it together with gold. And, you know, spent just meticulous hours putting this vase back together. And invited the, the the emperor back. And again, they had dinner, and the emperor was leaving. And as he was leaving, he handed him this most beautiful vase. Except now it was in broken pieces that's been glued together by gold. And and you can imagine now with this imperfect vase that's been put together, and you can see the the care that the nobleman has put together in order to make this vase. And all those little cracks, rather than making it look more ugly, actually enhance the look of the box. And so this is a story that I think, you know, a story that I heard a long time ago that really um, tells that concept of that wabi-sabi, which is the beauty or uh, perfection and imperfection. This concept that's kind of dual duality of, and the paradox, duality of sort yeah. of paradox. Well, I've noticed people with like um, their teeth will be a certain way and they'll get braces and get their teeth fixed and they're all perfect, but they've lost their character. So yes. in, in, in my mind, yes, they've lost beauty in my eyes. Yes. And I, yeah, I totally get that. Um, so can a, a face be too mathematically perfect or can things be too proportional to where you almost look like a Ken doll or, you know, you almost... To, to Doug's point, you lose your uh, personality. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, um, you know, we all know, for example, um, and it's something I see every day in, in my practice, uh, human bodies and faces are definitely not perfectly symmetric. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, I'm sure you've, you've seen those where you take one side of the face and you mirror it at the other side so if you take your right. left side of the face and mirror it to the other side and your right side of the face, you can actually create two different faces with the same face. So you'll have two different faces based on your right or left side if you were to make a, uh, a perfect uh, replica of it. And uh, when they look at those uh, perfected or perfectly s symmetrical faces um, and they surveyed people, uh, people actually found the original face that is... Uh, has some subtle asymmetries, and you know we're not talking major asymmetries, but definitely some asymmetries uh, within the norm of asymmetries. People found that to be much more beautiful than the perfectly symmetric face. Right. Um, so again, you know, really going back to that, uh, the beauty of imperfection, um, having subtle asymmetries uh, turns out to be sometimes more beautiful than perfectly yeah. symmetric. So, so, um, Dr. Sharif. Um, so if you took and made somebody perfectly symmetrical just by combining the two right halves of their face, they're going to be ugly, aren't they? Or are they going to be beautiful? Could you achieve beauty ever combining two right parts of someone's face, mirroring it? Or would they every time look weird? Um, well, no. I mean, you know, we obviously, when we are planning surgery uh, and planning aesthetic treatments, we want to start, strive for symmetry, okay. but we, we also explain uh, that really symmetry is is impossible to achieve. Whether it's a face, uh, uh, whether it's a, a breast, or you know, 
uh, no matter what part you're operating on, because we know we're not a, we're not sy perfectly symmetric. So we strive for symmetry, but we we emphasize that there, there may be some subtle subtle changes or subtle differences between the two sides, as long as they are uh, very very subtle. Um, and sometimes it's impossible to make it perfectly symmetric because you know our our cheekbones, for example, may be different. Uh, the amount of fat we have on our cheek is is a lot of times different. Uh, the yeah. eyebrow height, uh, hi, the eyebrows are always very asymmetric in most people I see. Um, and the nose, um, the eyelids. So as long as we are within a normal variation, that is still considered normal and very aesthetic. And we we, we point that out to to folks when they're uh, when we're analyzing faces. Yeah. You know, so, Doug, there's uh, one more um, yeah, go ahead. aspect that we talk about in the book, which is, you know, um, you know, when I was an undergrad, um, one of the class or the classes that I really enjoyed was in philosophy and trying to kind of, as we wrote this book, we also uh, added to it a lot of the, some of the philosophical thoughts that came throughout history. Now, both Western and Eastern, you know, my background, uh, I'm from Korea, and so uh, I came very uh, young, at a young age from Korea, emigrating around age 10. And so I feel that my life I had sort of experience from looking at things from both the East and the Western uh, philosophical viewpoint. One of the things that we really enjoy putting into the book uh, is sort of the Eastern philosophy. And an author, I don't, I don't know if you've ever read this book. Uh, that touched me is a book called Tao Te Ching. It's a ancient book, you know, coming out of China, but it talks about beauty. But you know, and and maybe I can just kind of read just a snippet that we put into the book. This yeah, is we'd love, love to. Program. Please. And and the part that we put in, and this is from Jonathan Starr's translation, that everyone recognizes beauty only because of ugliness. Everyone recognizes virtue only because of sin. Life and death are born together, difficult and easy, long and short, high and low. All these exist together. So, you know, in, in our conversation, as we are talking about beauty, it's also very important to think about, you know, what why something is beautiful. And it's also the flip side. The other side of the coin is ugliness, you know, and so you're, you're, you're thinking about that. And from neurosurgeon standpoint, you know, looking at those things from the brain or psychological neural circuit uh, level is that, you know, you, you've got to uh, really try to understand things at, at a little bit more deeper level. I mean, I, I, I certainly do think that the mathematical analysis, you know, is understanding things at a, at a deeper level, you know, Dr. Sheriff's. Uh, he taught me a lot about the proportions and the numbers and, you know, for example, the, you know, the golden ratio, you know, uh, I didn't really understand how a plastic surgeon, you know, puts a face together, but it's amazing that if you look at like the ratio between the length of your mouth to the length of your, you know, the n nose, that number is, if you calculate it, the perfect ones, the more, you know, the models and so forth, when you look at that, it gets closer and closer to the golden ratio number, you know? So, and, and what's amazing is there are so many of these different ratios, uh, not only in the face, but also rest of your body. For example, you know, when you look at a beautiful hand, the, these joints, the length from, you know, these are called the metacarpals and the phalanges. If you look at those ratios, it also follows the golden ratio. And, and these numbers are like just all over nature. Interesting. Um, so tell me more about the, I want to talk about the history of beauty because I would imagine it's changed. I mean, beauty is probably a little different now than it was 2000 years ago, or am I wrong? Or has it just stayed the same? No, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Doug. You know, the, uh, you know, beauty actually, you know, people have been trying to, uh, make modifications to their skin, uh, to their teeth, um, their faces and their bodies. That turns out since 
45,000 years ago. As a matter of fact, uh, the first tattoos that were discovered were uh, four or 5,000 BC. So that's, that's amazing to think about it. I mean, now we see tattoo arts uh, everywhere, but actually people have been trying uh, modifying their skin, uh, modifying the shapes of their head uh, based on different cultural uh, you know, uh, descriptions. Uh, people have been uh, really trying all kinds of practices, uh, you know, modifying the shape of, of their teeth, uh, using certain uh, colorings uh, from uh, from the soil to color their faces with certain, basically what, what today's makeup is all about. Uh, these practices are not new, actually. They've been around for, for a long time. But you're absolutely right. There is, seems to be a... Um, an evolution of our perception and understanding of beauty and there seems to be also cultural variation so what was considered beautiful in certain cultures and certain parts of the world may not hold true in other parts so there's definitely a um, a sort of a diverse understanding of this concept of beauty across cultures and also across time and you're absolutely right what we uh, think about as beautiful today um, has a very different um, very different definition from, let's say, you know, 10,000 years ago. For example, in, um, in, in the, you know, prehistoric times, um, you know, before uh, pasteurization of milk came around, um, women who were not able to breastfeed their kids, um, you know, that was a big, big problem because that means their kids would not be able to survive after their birth. So being able as a mother to breastfeed the child uh, was a key in uh, in really that that baby uh, basically surviving. And so in those days, beauty, if you look at some of the figurines discovered uh, from those times, beauty usually was manifested in these figurines with women with fairly uh, fairly voluptuous you know bodies and large breasts because that was sort of the motherly uh, perception of beauty at the time. Uh, if you're able to breastfeed your kid, um, then that's a sign of beauty, and that's what was attractive at the time, and that's what people wanted. Um, and that's definitely changing in today's uh, time, um, because you know we have you know we have pasteurized milk, and that's no longer an issue. So our perception of beauty is no longer focused on that uh, on that area. So definitely, it's 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 evolving and it's uh, changing, and and um, and what, what we consider beautiful today uh, may not hold true, you know, 50 years from now. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> of course, um, now we're in a, I think we're in a culture of a lot of body modification. Again, it's coming back. Um, I don't have any tattoos, but <laughs> a lot of people are getting them. And it's like face tattoos have become very common. Neck, t I mean, things that just would be shocking 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's just totally accepted now. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, uh, it's, it's very common. And, you know, it's, uh, and, you know, people tend to, uh, you know, wear different tattoos sometimes uh, based on certain uh, emotions or, you know, feelings yeah. or they want to signify art. Uh, and, and it's, it's definitely a form of body art, but it's definitely um, something that's, more common, like you said, today than, than, let's say, even, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but are people chasing dopamine, I mean, by doing this? What is the, what's the motivation? Yeah, yeah, that's a, you know, Doug, that's a great question. Um, because, pro you know, I would have to say uh, probably yes to your question. I mean, are people chasing dopamine? I. Uh, it seems that those acts that raise dopamine levels um, are are the things that people are chasing after. Now, let let, let me also say uh, one thing related to that, which is um, in modern age, where some of the dangers of chasing dopamine. Are, okay, so uh, what we're discovering also is that uh, drugs that artificially raise dopamine. And we know that drugs of abuse, cocaine, uh, oxycontin, I mean, you know, we're in a yeah. terrible epidemic. It's a horrible problem in this country or, right now. You know, with the, you know, opioids, you know, these synthetic opioids. We're in a terrible situation. I, I heard a terrible statistic 
that last year we had about 120,000 overdoses yeah. from the, you know, from these drugs. And so, but what we now know is that these drugs do raise your dopamine artificially, even higher than the, you know, what you might call natural ways. And so because of that, they become addictive. And so I, I think what this shows is that the dopamine can serve us, but it can also really harm us. Yeah. You know? So is it, this idea of artificial getting too much dopamine, you talk about like, you know, traditionally, like, for example, you know, you want to accomplish something, it, it takes a significant amount of time. I mean, look at what your guys have done, How you know, the, the schooling you had to go through and everything to get where you are in your career versus like I can play a video game and unlock 70 achievements in 20 minutes. <laughs> Is that fry your circuits to or like TikTok? You get a, an incredible video every two seconds that's tailored directly to you. Yeah, you know, I, I would say that and, and you know, we're just beginning actually to unlock this mystery, you know, but if we if I had to guess, Probably every time you see those, you know, TikTok videos, it gives you a little, you know, a little a dose little of jolt. It. Yeah. yeah, a little yeah. jolt. And so, and, and so you keep on desiring that. Now, one of the problems is that in order to get that same amount of dopamine the second time, now you need a little bit more and a little bit more mm. and a little bit more and a little bit more to the point that you're kind of addicted to it. So do you build up a tolerance almost to where, like you said, you need almost a stronger hit? Yeah. That's a good question. That's a great question. That's a great question. And, you know, um, modern science and psychology and, you know, these animal studies that's been done, it seems like the answer is yes. You know, that in order to get the same amount of pleasure, and, and that's part of the reason why we entitled our book, Beauty, Desire, and Dopamine. That, that it's not just the beauty that's important, but you know, if you see somebody, you know, the same beauty every day, well, the desire kind of goes down, you know, and so you need the higher level now in order to get the same amount of dopamine. Hit. And probably that's also, you know, related to all the mechanisms. Now, I, I, I want to make sure that the listeners does not think that we know everything about this circuit and yeah. the, the circuits, uh, but the technology that we're now seeing being able to actually measure it is is you know unraveling a lot of these mysteries. Can you can you measure it in real time? Oh yeah. Yeah. There are now technologies that's already been used in laboratory animals, you know, uh, very fast ways. You know, there are technologies called um, where you can take small samples from the brain called microdialysis and measure dopamine. And then there are now newer technologies that actually can measure it in the brain itself using, you know, specialized uh, what's called electrochemical techniques. And, you know, these are just amazing uh, scientific tools that neuroscientists have at its disposal to look at things like this that once we thought, you know, there's no way that we could even start understanding the biologic and mechanistic ways of talking about something as kind of, um, you know, non-scientific that you can measure. I mean, how, how is it possible to think about that you can measure beauty, you can, you know, measure desire and those things. Now, we're not directly measuring those things, but we're now seeing how these uh, neurotransmitter systems are operating. So you're, you're, you're kind of getting a correlation that you can build something off of. Yes. That's exactly right. So, so um, Dr. Sheriff, if if somebody's in a bad accident, they're used to their own, you know, beauty standard for themselves. You know, when they look in a the mirror, they're comfortable at least. Something happens where they get in an accident. Um, there's some traumatic injury to the face. Does this cause a kind of permanent dopamine drop? because they're depressed or because, you know what I mean? Obviously nobody wants to look, you know, ugly. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, you know, we, we, uh, the face and, and how we perceive our images is, is so critical in our everyday life. And, mm. you know, I mean, 
who, who does not look in the mirror in the morning before they go out of, yeah. out of their house, right? And so I think that uh, people who have these accidents, um, I mean, we, we see this in, 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 in our practice where, you know, you really, the focus is we, we do our best, we really do our best to try to restore uh, the person's appearance the best we can to what their normal used to be. And oftentimes we even ask them to bring photographs of themselves so we can really tailor the surgery to, to their face, um, you know, not just putting the bones back or, or the, the tissues back or the skin repairing, really trying to restore that same image. It's almost like recreating the puzzle of somebody's facial image back again. So we oftentimes actually do ask them for these photographs and we also use tools like, you know, 3D printing and, and virtual planning and, and really advanced technologies that now we are lucky to have uh, to really be able to uh, establish symmetry. Uh, if they had a previous uh, CT scan, we can bring that back and try to really mimic that same, uh, uh, the same bony anatomy they had of their face. Um, so you're absolutely right, because a lot of these patients are very sensitive to changes in their in their facial shape, and and they, it does cause a lot of you know a lot of anxiety and sometimes depression and oftentimes yeah. isolation. Um, so so know, is because, it, well, I'm going to interrupt you. Is is anxiety and depression and those kinds of things dopamine killers? In other words, is there a drug that gets released from your brain that actually removes the dopamine? Well, you know. I, I, since you're talking about depression and, and, and so forth, there's another neurotransmitter that appears to be very important for uh, depression, and that's called serotonin. Okay. And so and it's, uh, this is another uh, neurotransmitter or neuromodulator that affects, you know. And so uh, this is the, the chemical in your brain that people who are depressed, the psychiatrist would put them on what's called SSRIs, serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors. So these are drugs that elevate your level of serotonin. And uh, we now know that SSRIs are very helpful to treat patients with uh, depression. So, but as I said, you know, the neuropharmacology uh, of all of this is, you know, pretty complicated and we're now beginning to unlock some of those mysteries. Well, I, I what, 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 what are the chemicals that create happiness? <laughs> Is there a list of them? Serotonin's one, dopamine. Are there other ones? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, the endorphins, uh, you know, uh, they say sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, um, you know, hugging, hugging your, 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 your family or hugging your spouse or hugging your friend, your best friend, um, that releases certain chemicals. You know, some of those, you know, they say oxytocin, for example, uh, can be released. So, so certainly, you know, we're, we're very complex and I, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lee is an expert in this area, but not just one chemical can explain it all. Uh, they, they, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of chemicals, uh, probably hundreds, if not thousands. And they, they, all, they, all, yeah. they all interplay, interplay but uh, the dopamine is, is a major player. And yeah. it's definitely very high on the list. Okay. And it seems to have a, a major impact on what happens downstream of it. So, yeah, and, it's, I, and it's, I want to get to your question, uh, one uh, other aspect of your question. So your question is um, getting to sort of mechanism. There's there's another aspect of that question that I want to make sure that the your audience perhaps sees. You're getting to what's called in science now reductionism. You know, we've spent so much time in, in sci as a scientist to go down further and further into smaller and smaller parts to understand mechanism. And so this concept, you know, where you go from the whole person down to the organs, down to the tissue, down to the cell, down to the uh, receptors, the proteins, down to even the chemical, right? Dopamine, serotonin, we talk. And that concept is called reductionism. Now we're beginning to look at this, not reductionistic, but holistic, meaning that as you go from smaller and smaller components into the bigger things, there's something very interesting that's going on, and that is complexity theories. So this is where 
we are now able to see that when you go from more reductionist view of chemical and go up to the next level, you start to see qualities that did not exist in the lower level. So for example, you know, you want to know, well, what are the list of chemicals, right? You want to know, is it dopamine? Is it serotonin? Is it oxytocin? Is it all of that? But we're now beginning to unravel and realizing that, you know, in the Western system of analysis, it was very, we, we wanted to go down to the reductionist listing. While I mentioned earlier, my background on the Asian side is actually they move more towards a holism, holistic. Holistic. You know? yeah. yeah, holistic. Yeah. And so even the concept of beauty actually doesn't exist at the molecular level. And the reason is because these are special qualities that starts to emerge. And that's why there's a new science that's actually emerging called the science of emergence. Meaning that the science and the understanding of beauty and desire doesn't rest at the reductionistic level of a chemical, but rather how the whole person is. And then we get to this in the book as well. And I really love uh, Dr. Sheriff added this in the book, looking at the now holistic individual and then what are the components of that. And he writes about the, the four components. I, I wonder if you want to let the audience know about that. And this was really a lot of, uh, a lot of discussions. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Lee and I actually work out in the morning uh, at 5.30 every, every day almost. And a lot of these ideas are early morning uh, ideas and, and discussions. And uh, we were thinking, what is it that we really need for a, you know, to have a holistic, uh, happy person, a person that's, uh, you know, happy and uh, and really, uh, you know, self-actualization in a sense. And we, we felt that really, you, you need your health. So we we thought about the body quotient. Uh, so the BQ, uh, you need your ability to learn as a person and learn from mistakes and, and learn from experiences. And we, I don't like the IQ because IQ is more like innate. You know, some people are born uh, with higher IQ than others maybe, and that could be debatable, but really your ability to learn. Uh, so we, we call that the, uh, you know, the learning, the learning quotient. Um, and then your emotional quotient, your, your ability to, uh, to, to really be able to have perspective on your emotions, uh, your interactions with others. Um, and then the fourth dimension is the spiritual part. And I think, you know, regardless what, you know, what the, your beliefs are, I think a lot of us feel the need for a spiritual component to feel that uh, holistic, uh, you know, sense of being really. And, and then, you know, with the, with the, with the four components, uh, we, we sort of came up with the name, the, the bless, the bless cue, you know, you're really, you're blessed. You get less, you know, the BQ, the body quotient, the EQ, the emotional quotient, the, the, LQ, the, the learning quotient, the learning quotient yeah. uh, and the spiritual quotient. If you have these four, uh, we feel that this is like the, the ultimate uh, sort of holistic uh, <clears throat> of, 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 of wholesomeness and really self-actualization. Yeah, I, I absolutely love this. Uh, this is something that Dr. Sheriff one day brought and, and said, you know, Kendall, listen, uh, I, I, I made this, you know, B-L-E-S, you know, body quotient, learning quotient, emotional quotient, spiritual quotient. And then he made a little tag uh, on our t-shirt and he made, he brought that in. And so sometimes when we work out, we wear this t-shirt and it's a, it, you know, it's a great fun, but it comes from our book, you know, really thinking about more the holism, the whole individual. And so, you know, I think in the West, we, we want to try to break everything down and, and you know, let's find a drug that can cure depression, you know, uh, give pleasure, give happiness and all that. But I think in some ways, perhaps the East got it, you know, maybe a little bit better in, in the sense that, you know, as I talked about earlier, the concept of wabi-sabi and, and, you know, the uh, Zen philosophers where, you know, you really try to look at the holistic view of things rather than, the reductionistic only. And I think probably the true answer is to look at them together at the same time. But isn't it true that technology is pushing us towards 
finding all these little tiny chemicals and the formula. And in, in the end, uh, it's cool that you guys are thinking about this holistic, you know, that there's spirit, spirituality is important. It's, it's really cool, that, you know, that you guys are actually thinking that way. But no doubt there'll be things we cannot find and never will be able to figure out. But I would still imagine there's probably still some more chemicals that are going to show up in somebody's research, correct? That's going to throw a, a wrench maybe in the whole thing and the whole, you know, the whole dopamine and the serotonin and the oxytocin and all this. Is there some chemical that you guys are aware of now that our audience would never had never have heard of? This is untold radio. So is there some new chemical that's, that researchers are working on discovering? Well, um, you know, one of the things that we're discovering is that a lot of the chemicals that causes, um, you know, these drugs of abuse, for example, yeah. Uh, oh, you know, the right now we're, we're having terrible time with the opioids, right? And synthetic opioids. But what we're discovering is there are chemicals, what's called endogenous opioids. As it turns out, our brain naturally makes these chemicals. And, and probably that is the reason why these external chemicals, you know, coming from um, plants, for example, actually bind in our brain and our brain have their own receptors for it. Mm. And so the thought is now that there is a evolutionary reason for all of this, you know, that uh, perhaps these plants have these drugs and that we're now discovering, you know, like I'm sure your audience have heard about mushrooms and so forth, you know, that these chemicals, but we're now discovering yeah. that there's, it's, uh, you know, human counterpart that we already have. And the, these, and, and there's so many different ones of them. And some of them are not just chemicals, but they're proteins and so forth that through somehow through evolution that it also already exists. And so, you know, yeah. I think the endogenous opioid story is also a, a very fascinating one. Perhaps it's, it's not one that, you know, we can get too much into today. We're kind of, and our book is kind of focused on dopamine, but there are, yes, uh, to your question, there are so many other chemicals that we're now discovering. Yeah. So fascinating. It really is. I mean, happiness is very strange. It is. It's just such a strange duck. Um, yeah. I find myself for myself, I'm the happiest when I'm just busy and I'm just, interested in so many things and topics and i have no problem with you know depression or anything only based on that it works for me um other people need other things i don't drink i don't do any of that stuff i just get totally high on life by just now, Doug, you know, learning about really things that you say that you know because you say depression all that you know so the other thing that's very important from neurosurgeon neuroscientist perspective is how you in, internally interpret the thing. So for example, you know, Doug, I'm sure you heard about the uh, five senses. Yeah. Right? So, you know. Since I was a little uh, kid, yeah. Yeah, of course. But one thing that we're now beginning to uh, look into more and more is actually there's a, another sense that we didn't really uh, see, okay? There's a sixth sense. And that sixth sense is your own brain's ability to sense its thought. Mm. Okay, so and so if you expand think about on it, this, this is interesting. Yeah, it's a uh, and and uh, believe it or not, the National Institute of Health is also very interested in and in understanding this concept more. So the senses, you know, the beauty, the eyesight, the smell, and all of this, you know, we focused on the sensation of the body that comes from the external world to the internal world. Well, think about this. Your ability to know that you're thinking, that's a sensation. Yeah. You see? So sometimes I think where some people get terribly depressed and so forth is they hear their own voices and, you know, it's like very negative and so forth. Well, what the Zen philosophers kind of talk about is listen to that 
but realize that that's not really you, you know? And so, and so your ability to kind of have a higher level of sensation becomes really important, you know? So for example, and amazingly as a neuroscientist, we're now beginning to look at the circuitry for that. And, you know, so we know, for example, the five senses, you know, the, it's amazing that we have been able to decipher the human body's sensation. For example, let's take touch, you know, when you touch your hand. We know that those pressure sensors, the temperature sensors, uh, actually, and the pain sensors, we now know all those circuits as it goes from the nerve to your spinal cord, from your spinal cord, it goes up to your uh, brain stem, and from your brain stem, it goes into an area of the brain called a thalamus. And from a thalamus, it goes into your sensory cortex, you know? Well, we're now figuring out those descending circuits as well that goes from your cortex back down into your thalamus. And the, there are these circuits that we have now discovered. And, and perhaps it's because of those circuits. And, and this is the part that is absolutely amazing that we, it's almost like there's an inner eye, you know, inner eye that can listen and sense that your thoughts, you know, and, and one of the things that becomes very important is as you look, look at that sensation, that almost amazing kind of Zen moment where you realize, no, wait a minute, that's not really me, but it's the person who is observing those sensations, you know? So, so these are some of the, you know, concepts we, we talked about that are somewhat philosophical and almost spiritual, I think. And then this is really tied into the emotional intelligence part. And I think, you know, those of us who can recognize these things uh, in, in a much easier way than others, it, it certainly can impact their way of perceiving uh, themselves, uh, their experiences on a daily basis. And, and sometimes that impacts how you interact with others around you. Uh, I, I think we've all had days when you, Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you have maybe certain thoughts. Sometimes they can be negative thoughts or you are talking about something that happened the day before. And and if you recognize that and you're able to literally uh, sort of, uh, you know, think of it like Dr. Lee just mentioned and say, you know what, that's not me. I'm not going to turn that off and turn on the positive mode, positive energy. Uh, that can completely transform your day. Your next conversation with someone uh, at work or, you know, uh, whatever you are, it can have a profound effect on your experience. So I think uh, it's really all ties in together. So are you guys talking about basically um, some sort of practice of mindfulness? And um, if, if that's the case, ha there's so many different ways that it's at least being taught out there as there's like scientific backing or in your guys' research or that has been proven to be more effective. Uh, you know, excellent, uh, you know, catch that I, I would say, yeah, that is correct. You know, in some ways, the sixth sense that I'm talking about, your internal ability to sense your thought is mindfulness. It's exactly that. And that's exactly right. And so you can do it, you know, by even exercising and so forth or through meditations and so forth. You know? But the important point that I want to say about as it relates to our book, is to look at these concepts, you know, beauty, desire, and dopamine, not in isolation, but also look at it in the, you know, in the more holistic way, and, and, and perhaps recognize that these perceptions, you know, these, these mindfulness aspects are important as well. So, for example, so if you, we, we talk about in the book, um, we, we, we talk about Mulala, and I'm sure your audience has, you know, heard about it. You've heard about it. Where, you know, here is a uh, young child who went on a bus and, you know, really uh, wanted to go to school and, and learn. But unfortunately, uh, got blown up and, and there was disfigurements. You know, I, I, I saw, for example, the these, this story of Mulala and... You know the the picture that you see is even though there was disfigurement in the because of the bomb i actually saw beauty there and 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 we get into talking about that that there is this other side to beauty the inner beauty that becomes incredibly important so you know 
I think Dr. Sheriff, uh, you know, all these things that are in cosmetic surgery and plastic and reconstructive surgery and how important that is. You know, that's another aspect of the work that Dr. Sheriff does. That is, for example, you know, a police officer or a, a or one of our wounded warriors that go to war that gets, you know, blown up and the face is disfigured. And he does some amazing surgeries, I can tell you. I, I love going to his OR and observing how he fixes something that is terribly disfigured and, you know, and, and fixes that face and the importance of that. But also that when we look at something, when you hear the story behind, you know, what happened is that when you hear that inner beauty and you interpret that, you can see even greater beauty, you know? And, and I think that's the part where uh, we're beginning to see socially that, you know, those individuals who are, you know, perhaps, I, I don't know, what, what would you say the word is somewhat superficial? You know, we use the word superficial, where there's perhaps great external beauty, but there's no great inner beauty. And when you observe that enough time, you know, the, you do not desire that. You do not want that. And, and eventually, I think even that external beauty fades. Interesting. So what, just to get, I mean, there's so many topics I want to talk about. The future of plastic surgery, obviously it's changed and involved. It's getting more sophisticated. But what are some of the new things that are coming down the pike, Dr. Sheriff? Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of exciting things uh, when really now the focus is on uh, customizing surgeries for every patient, you know, so um, we're, we're in a state where we can actually uh, imagine the treatment. So there are uh, programs where you can do simulation treatments and um, and you can actually show show the patient what they may look like. And, and there are ways to actually get there during the, during the surgery. You can actually have models and things that would actually help the surgeon achieve the outcome that they uh, sort of discuss with the patient. So uh, these tools, you know, when it comes to simulation and uh, virtual planning, uh, augmented reality, um, not only in plastic surgery, but also I think it's going to be coming to neurosurgery. These are going to be really, really exciting. Uh, new technology is going to integrate with uh, with the surgeon and uh, the machine learning part, you know, uh, we, we talk about robotics, we talk about, you know, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of these things are going to be incorporated into our daily lives as surgeons. And I think the next, you know, 10 to 15 years are going to be uh, really, really exciting for all the young surgeons and, and, and med students and everyone who's, who's training because we're, we're going to have so much more to harness from than just our own internal ability, for yeah. example. What, what about tissue printing? Is that something that's coming yeah, down the so, pike? Absolutely. So, you know, like cartilage is, is usually the easier uh, sort of tissue to work with because you can print a thin layer of cartilage that can rely on that blood supply. So um, they've, they're, they're, they've, they've been able to print that, you know, for ear reconstruction. Um, so. I think that is a very promising uh, technology that eventually if somebody's, for example, born without an ear or someone lost part of the ear because of cancer surgery or trauma, that you may be able to print, you print uh, a replica or a missing part of that ear uh, based from their own cells. So you don't have to have them on immunosuppression. And, and I think, you know, uh, these, uh, these technologies and these sort of uh, really breakthrough studies are really paving the way to uh, think outside the box um, because you know there are things even in today's age we cannot do very well you know think about the lip uh, lip animation the, the mouth is a very complex structure and if someone loses a big part of their lip it's really hard to reconstruct that in a very aesthetic way and that's functional so uh, we you know sometimes you have to think outside of the box in terms of coming up with the new solutions to sort of old problems that even today we're not still not very good at. Um, so, uh, so I think you know tissue engineering, uh, bioprinting, like you mentioned, uh, virtual planning, um, all of these are very exciting developments that we're going to be seeing over the next ten to fifteen years. Is is this something on um, this tissue printing? Is it happening now? I mean, 
Can you utilize that now or is it still in the future? You know, there have been uh, isolated case studies and a lot of it now because of the experimental nature of it, you have to uh, get some sort of, uh, you know, permission uh, from an ethical board uh, to do it. But uh, definitely when we see more and more of these success stories and these case reports are isolated uh, from around the world, is definitely encouraging more and more of us to think about that. Um, so yeah. skin is another, is another one where, you know, um, people have significant burns, you know, and this has been available now for quite some time. You can actually expand their skin uh, in a lab and, and, and bring that to, to replace big parts of their skin if they're missing a lot of it because you cannot just take skin grafts. Uh, you only have a, such a small amount uh, remaining if they have a significant burn, for example. So I think um, really this is when, you know, uh, sort of the, the, the synergy between, you know, technology, our understanding of, 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 uh, of biology and, and, and medicine and surgery with, with the available tool is, is going to help us, you know, really figure out the next solution uh, for a lot of these complex yeah. problems. And the same for aesthetics. And Doug, you know, I want to add one more thing uh, to what, Dr. Sharoff just said, you know, and your question of uh, tissue printing and so forth. The area that I'm involved in, uh, you know, you introduced me as stereotech and functional neurosurgeon. What that means is we're using serotaxis or image guidance systems and functional neurosurgery. And what that means is we're now not only changing the looks of the appearance, but rather the function uh, of the brain and the circuit. So for example, uh, rather than tissue printing, what we're now doing, amazingly, is using circuits, actual like computer circuits. And we're, uh, this is called brain machine interfacing. And I, I, I'm sure, you know, probably you've heard about some of the work that's going on related to that, where we're now implanting special circuits. And that's what really deep brain stimulation is, you know. I, mentioned this uh, earlier at the beginning. And how, so, how is that, how is the interface happen? What, yeah. Isn't that diamonds or? Well, that, that, that interface happens at the level of electrodes and, uh, and you know, um, what's happened is, if I can go back to history just a little bit. Sure. Is that scientists discovered electricity initially, right? And then we found out that the way that our nerves function is electricity. So, you know, probably you might have heard about the very early experiments where, you know, frog legs or, you know, decapitated frogs, you know, the, they discovered that if you just stimulate the spinal cord, you can actually move the frog's leg. You know, the, the, those were very early experiments, you know, that, that, identified that the basic mechanism by which the brain cells and these nerves work is electricity, you know, which, you know, back then they would have never guessed that that discovery is now has leading to the work that we do in serotech and functional neurosurgery, where we're now putting electrodes. These are electrodes made out of platinum iridium. They're metal that we implant into the brain and we deliver current to them. And now the devices that we have, you can deliver either current, what's called current isolated stimulation or voltage isolated stimulation. E either way, basically what it's doing is now we're injecting electrons and this electricity is causing the brain circuits to change. You know, I can tell you when I first saw one of these operations during my residency, I, I thought it was just magical, you know, I remember I was a second year resident and the, for the first time I was involved in this at Dartmouth where my mentor, Dr. Roberts, would implant these into patients, you know, with patients with tremor like this, you implant this electrode, turn it on and tremor is gone. I mean, it just blew my mind, wow. absolutely blew my mind, you know? And so when I first saw that, I set on and I said to myself, oh my gosh, this is so magical. I want to figure out how are we doing this? What's the mechanism, you know? And we have now, you know, after 20 years of research, we have found out so much of how that happens. And one of the reasons why in our book, we mentioned dopamine is that 
these uh, brain machine interface devices are able to control the release of these chemicals, neurochemicals, mm -hmm. dopamine being one, you know, adenosine is another, uh, serotonin, glutamate, all of these things. And so from those early days where we could control the movement of a frogland, and you know, you could imagine when this was demonstrated, this was in London and England, when this was first demonstrated, people thought this was just absolutely magical, you know, absolutely magical. And even today, we're using that technology to be able to do what we can do now. And so, you know, if you were to ask me, what is the future of, uh, of neurosurgery? It's more and more technologies where, you know, another word for it is called, uh, uh, you know, brain computer interfacing, where we're not only doing tissue regeneration, you know, biologic systems where you're making cells and now, of course, we're moving into uh, stem cells and, and those kind of biologic systems. But another system, and the word for that is called uh, electroceuticals. You know, I'm sure you've heard about pharmaceuticals yeah. where you control pharma, you know, drugs. Now we're talking about electroceuticals where we implant these devices that then release the endogenous chemicals. And what are all the things that can be improved in for a person's life with electroceuticals? What can you do with it? What magic can be worked with it? Well, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, when President Obama uh, put forth what's called the Brain Initiative, this was, you know, something that he started, um, where a lot of the National Institute of Health funding went into this, called the Brain Initiative, and we are now from that initiative on the uh, with so much new discoveries uh, that's been made about how we can now use electroceuticals. So some of the newer uh, disorders that's being thought of is not only movement disorder like Parkinson's disease, but also things, you know, perhaps uh, what a, a lot of our physician colleagues in internal medicine are working on. Things even like blood pressure management, you know, um, well, I mean, we already know about heart pacemakers, you know, to control the heart, which is actually, uh, frankly, that's where the deep brain stimulation technology came out of. From is, I mean, isn't, isn't that, isn't a pacemaker an electroceutical in some ways? Yes, exactly right. You are absolutely right. A pacemaker is an electroceutical because what's happening there is the electrode is implanted into the heart. And it's causing the heart to beat at a at a certain you know right. certain rate, and the way that it's controlling the heart actually it has to do with the part of the heart that is actually part of the nervous system, you know the the beating part the SA node, it's called the sinoatrial node, uh, and the AV node, atrioventricular node AV nodes. These are actually derived from the brain, so that that's the uh, so in some ways, that is the reason why these heart pacemakers were the early predecessors to the deep brain stimulation devices. So um, would, would that possibly, I mean, can you make dopamine with these electroceuticals? Well, I, I don't think you're uh, making dopamine, but what you're doing is uh, you, we are now able to put in electrodes that can stimulate those dopamine cells to release the dopamine. Right. Okay. And because now we can actually sense that dopamine, you know, there are technologies that can now uh, use what, what are called closed loop stimulations, where you can sense something and control it. And of course, you know, what's amazing to me is that physicians have also teamed up with biomedical engineers to develop these devices. You know, it's really interesting because one of our uh, colleagues, you know, there's four of us that we call ourselves the 5 a.m. club, you know, at the gym. And the four of us, uh, one of the members is Dr. Yun Bei Oh, who is actually a biomedical engineer who's developing these type of technologies. Amazing. Um, so so what's the future for electroceuticals? Do you, could you, you know, if you use your imagination, what would be some of the dreams? That could be accomplished. Well, I, I think where we want to go is now that we're beginning to understand the mechanism 
by which all of these devices are working, we can now take a step back and start re-engineering them more intelligently. You know, uh, the way that we've kind of developed these technologies to a certain extent was out of serendipity. You know, we, we put it in, we figured it out and it's working beautifully. But now that we are actually beginning to understand how they are working, we can re-engineer them. You know, the analogy I give is kind of like um, the Wright brothers first airplane. The special thing that the Wright brothers did was not to create the first human flight. You know, that was done actually before. What the Wright brothers did was they understood the first human controlled flight. So rather than just gliding, they could actually control that airplane by understanding aerodynamics, you know, at a very rudimentary level. But we're, right. by understanding that aerodynamic mechanism, look where we are now, you know, from the time of the Wright brothers in less than a hundred years, you know, the year that I was born, I was born in 1969. What's so amazing about 1969 is that that was the year that we put a man on the moon. Can, you know, I mean, think about that, that in under a hundred years from first human controlled flight, we went to the moon. Yeah. And therefore what we see in this kind of electroceuticals is something similar that in less than a hundred years, we're going to, uh, this technology that we're using today it's going to seem like the Wright brothers' first airplane when you compare it to where we're going to go. So you're thinking someone who's like completely disabled might be able to walk comfortably using some of this technology, for example. Oh, absolutely. And I can tell you that technology is being worked on already. It's amazing. <clears throat> so I want to talk about aging a little bit more in beauty perception of, of people who are getting older. So <laughs> obviously when you're 75, your perception of beauty is going to change, correct? I mean, you're going to be more accepting of having a mate and seeking out a mate and seeing beauty in another 70 year old, but that's not something you would do when you're 14, you know, or 18 or what, you know what I mean? You, you, you get where I'm going. Um, how, how does all that work? Why do we, why does our, our, our level of beauty and the types of things we see beautiful change as we get older? Is that something you guys have explored? I mean, you know, this is a really interesting question. You know, we, like you said, we see it, we, we see it every day. And uh, yeah. a lot of, a lot of our, uh, uh, you know, patients or customers seeking uh, aesthetic surgery, they're usually very mindful of their age. And uh, and a lot of times they, they, they say, you know, I, I do not want to look like when I was 20 years old because I know I'm older. I know I have different skin and I've aged, you know. Um, I want to look just like me, just refreshed. So uh, you're right. You know, we, 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 we think about beauty, you know, and some people define beauty by youth. And that's a philosophical question. And but some people argue that it's not necessarily the youth, really. It's it's about, you know, uh, sometimes acceptance or, or 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 really helping people age gracefully, in a sense, you know, because aging is just it's like Doctor really mentioned with that uh, with the book, you know, uh, the Tao Te Ching. You know, I think aging is just is unstoppable. It's just it's just part of life. There is all kinds of treatments being thought about in, in, in delaying aging, but we know that you know it's just a natural process, just like you know being born. Um, and and I think you know, I do think that our perception of beauty changes with time. You know what what you may have thought as as being beautiful, the most beautiful when you were a teenager, uh, may be different now. Uh, I mean I, I can see that myself. You know. Um, so I think our perception of beauty is influenced by our life experiences yeah. and, and somehow that, that changes with time. So it's not a constant, uh, which is really why beauty is such an elusive concept that's very hard to pin down in one word or one description or mathematical formula. Um, it's, 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 it's something that's going to be debated for, for the rest of time. Yeah. 
it is it is interesting because <laughs> one you have to tolerate yourself as you get older looking in the mirror because sometimes you go oh who is that you know you don't even you know sometimes you'll i'll look down at my own hands and go those aren't my hands <laughs> but you you um you do become um you, your standards do change beauty standards as you get older and um it's, it's just so interesting is this something you guys cover in your book yeah, aging we do talk and, about uh, yeah, we talk about the uh, biology of beauty and uh, and aging and okay. uh, you know there's, there's some really really fascinating studies being done now and we're, we're just scratching the surface, doc, when it comes to aging and anti aging, or or you know halting aging and uh, there's there's a lot of uh, exciting uh, thoughts about it and um, you know who knows what's going to be in, in 10, 15 years from now, uh, but as we understand the mechanism behind aging. Yeah. Uh, whether we can slow that uh, really in, in real life with, with either medication, stem cells, regenerative medicine, <clears throat> all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, ideas. Uh, but we, we do go into that in our book as well. So I heard from, from, from you, Dr. Lee, I heard the, the, I don't know what it means, DBS technology, does that mean anything that we should be talking about? Or uh, no? You mean as it relates to aging? Well, into what I don't even know what it means. We were we were in a conversation, and you spouted out. Uh, I think it was DBS technology, and I don't know what it means. Can you can you expound on that a bit? Well, you know, I, I'm not sure um, as it relates to aging per, you know, per se. Well, I'm not saying it relates to aging. I just wanted to oh. know what it was. Oh well, where I was getting to, you know, in that conversation, perhaps was. Uh, we are now with uh, neuromodulation technologies trying to treat things such as dementia, okay. you know, like, you know, aging uh, disorders like Alzheimer's disease. What's happening to our society is that the whole society is aging. I mean, the, you know, yeah. and, and this is uh, probably going to be a real problem in the future. And the you know, medical community is keenly aware of this. You know, what are we going to do when uh, we have so many of our population who has Alzheimer's? Well, believe it or not, DBS, deep brain stimulation, is now being tested for uh, for for memory enhancement. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, all right. I didn't know it stood for deep brain stimulation. Yeah. So DBS is deep just, brain stimulation. Gotcha. You know? Now, now gotcha. this is kind of this is very cutting edge. So this is yeah. an area that has not been proven. You know, the disorders that we talked about earlier, uh, Parkinson's disease, tremor, dystonia, even obsessive compulsive disorder. These are disorders mm -hmm. that the FDA has already approved for physicians like myself to, to be able to implant these devices mm -hmm. because there is good scientific evidence for using them. In the area of um, Alzheimer's disease or you know, dementias, memory enhancement, that we're just beginning to study. And and so, but there are early work that perhaps shows that we may be able to, you know, use the DBS technology or deep brain stimulation technology gotcha. for the memory circuits. And the reason for that is because <clears throat> we now understand the memory circuits. You know, one of the most important circuit there is called the Papaz circuit. You know, Dr. Papaz identified the circuit that involves such areas in your brain as the hippocampus, fornix. Uh, you know, th these are circuits that we know very well. Well, what's incredible is if you put an electrode into an area of the brain called the fornix or near this fibers, it's been discovered that perhaps you can evoke memory. Now, this is very early on, and it's at the cutting edge. We don't know yet where that line of research is going, but you can see how important it would be uh, if we find out that DBS could be useful for dementia, yeah. like Alzheimer's dementia. <clears throat> Very interesting. Are there, um, like like for deep brain stimulation or any of these kind of implants, is this one way you two can work together by, by um, Dr. Sheriff trying to hide things, some of these, <laughs> these, these batteries and computers is that something that you guys find in common and i would imagine you got to be talking about that 
we, you know, we have. And over fact, breakfast. We have been doing that kind of surgeries together. Oh, where, okay. uh, you know, I would do the brain implant surgeries. But as it turns out, you know, the batteries uh, right now, we put it, you know, in places that may not be so cosmetically pleasing. And yeah. so I approached Dr. Sheriff and, you know, we're working on those issues. Like, like right. you said, you know, where do you put the battery? Well, we could just put it in, you know, or, uh, <laughs> you know, we could hide it and, and do a more, you know, better cosmetic, you know, look to this. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Hide the battery. Hide the battery. Yeah. A battery in their, in their arm or their, you know, forearm or wherever. It'd be much better to hide it somewhere in your buttocks yeah. or yeah. God knows yeah. where. Is there going to be a way where you guys can charge the batteries without removing them or swapping them out? Oh, oh boy. You know, Doug, those technologies <laughs> are actually already coming. Oh, okay. So, I'm really so into I'm really into lithium ion technology <laughs> here. I'm you, you have no idea. Oh gosh. But I I, I would imagine that um, it won't be long then you won't have to replace them, correct? You can Yeah. The the rechargeable batteries, uh, that technology wasn't so good in the past. Mm. But the the these are systems that are now being approved by the US FDA. So amazing. So um, what about, I want to talk just a bit and we're going to let you guys go. We got to talk about e Elon Musk. What, what the heck is he doing? He's doing Neuralink stuff and you guys must know all about this. Yes, yes. Uh, that's an area that uh, I am familiar with uh, Elon Musk's work with Neuralink yeah. and so forth. And, you know, I, I think that the some of the... You know, the technologies are early. They're very complicated. You know, these are, I, I used earlier the, you know, man going to the moon. You know, I, I, I think one of the things that I often think about that uh, my mentor talked about is we often overestimate where we will be in five years, but underestimate where we will be in 10 years. I mean, it's a little paradox, isn't it? If you think about yeah, it. It how is. is that possible? You know. So, so, do you think these breakthroughs will basically be exponential, or you know, that the speed will pick up as we compound um, all the uh, developments that you guys learn along the way? Well, I mean, the answer is look back on history. Yeah. And you know that that's how it's been, and so there's no reason to think that's going to change. You know. And what's very interesting is if you look at how technologies develop, you know, things go on and on and on. And then a whole new way, and these are called paradigm shifts. Mm. You know, a paradigm shift happens the way you just, everything that you think about, you know, totally changes. Some of those innovations come in technology, but it can also come in the form of mathematics, you know, we began this discussion talking about the different mathematical principles that a cosmetic surgeon uses, you know, now thinking about beauty in terms of golden ratios, you know, in my world of uh, functional neurosurgery and really in engineering, one of the paradigm shift came out of how we even think about numbers. And, and we talk about this a little bit in our book where, you know, we used to think about numbers just in the real component one, two, three, four, and so forth. But now engineering, we think about numbers in terms of complex numbers, meaning that there's a real component to a number and what's called the imaginary component to a number, you know? And what we have discovered is that when we look at the external world and kind of think about things, that amazingly the brain itself can interpret that world in the ways that are, you know, quite, quite surprising. So who, who do you guys think is the most beautiful person in the world right now? <laughs> well, that, that's Just... a great question. And so I'm going to answer that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm not trying to embarrass you, Dr. Yeah. Lee. I'm just, I'm just really curious. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to answer that 
where be careful are um, you married well, i know you I, we've got to be very careful because i think like the show just thought our wives are watching this <laughs> and of course our wives you know but, but i want to answer that with a with a story and maybe you know one last very short story okay which is when when i was a medical student i was at yale and when i was a medical student there there was a patient um, a, a young child that was operated on by both neurosurgery and plastic surgery, because this child had what's called cranial deformity, craniosynostosis problem. And unfortunately, um, this patient, very young baby, unfortunately, the, the patient died during surgery. So we had to report this during what's called M&M, &M, Morbidity and Mortality Conference on Surgeons. And it was, a, uh, it was a conference that we both had neurosurgeons there and plastic surgeons there because they were both involved. But what was amazing to me is they presented a photograph, and I will never forget this, a photograph. The mother was this beautiful mother who held this child because of the uh, cranial deformities. The child, you know, uh, to anybody else would say not so beautiful but you could see this look in the mother's eyes with holding this child that you could tell that that to that mother that child was the most beautiful child on earth you could see it and so i'm ending this by highlighting that story which we talk about yeah. in our book very, that very beauty neat. really is in the eyes of the beholder mm. Yeah. Good, that's, good answer. That's absolutely right. You know, and uh, I, I echo everything Dr. Uh, Lee mentioned, you know, um, a lot of times we have experiences with people where maybe the first impression, um, you look at their face and you're, you see beauty. It could be, a, could be a handsome person, it could be a beautiful woman. And all it takes is two minutes of conversation where you, you get this sense that, uh, whatever that impression was initially, before having that connection, social, emotional connection with them, uh, where you change your perception. They're no longer as beautiful as they were just two minutes ago, just based on two minutes of conversation. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's uh, how the, the emotions of it can really impact the, the, our perception of beauty. And I think uh, this story really illustrates that very well. It's very cool. And... Um... One last really quick question. Um, two people meet, they fall in love because why is it? I mean, what, and this has got, I'm sure you guys have addressed this in your book. There's no way you couldn't. Can you just elaborate on your <laughs> angle there? Because it's one of the great mysteries of life. I mean, clearly the first thing that happens, you know, um, unless this was a meeting online and, you know, it was really based on sort of your interaction with that person before seeing them. But, you know, clearly the first thing that happens is we, we see that person. We look into their eyes. Yes. And I think that first look um, has a profound impact on, uh, on our experience in terms of wanting to explore, uh, to know that person more. And, but then the rest is history. But I think that first, the first impulse is, in, in my mind, and this coming from plastic surgeon, is really based on the external. Um, and, and eventually, uh, the internal may surpass that, uh, you know, much, much more. But that right. first, first contact, I think that's very critical. Very interesting. So um, uh, wh when do you guys predict this book will be done? You know, we're really, uh, we work on this on weekends. Uh, oftentimes okay. we, we, we exercise and obviously we're, we're both very busy surgeons, but um, we're really hoping this is going to be um, sometime in 2023, so sometime next year. Okay. Uh, and uh, we're really excited about that. <clears throat> well, we're going to hope, we're hoping you guys will come back and we can explore all sorts of other topics because you guys are deep. <laughs> both you guys are amazing, absolutely amazing. And I can only imagine all the people that you've helped over the years and, and just, I don't know. I really look up to both of you. So. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us, Alex. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. We've really enjoyed this. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Dr. Lee. Thanks, Dr. Sheriff. Thank you. It's been great fun. Yep. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. I call you up in the middle of the night. Been
bothered by dreams ain't feeling alright You give me comfort, say just give it some time By the end of our talk I'm feeling just fine You and I will always know where we belong This ain't no ordinary love we got going Should be in doubt.